Hi, I'm Robert Rich, and I am from the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California. I think the word space implies open space, the possibilities of, of emptiness within and between the notes. It doesn't necessarily need to be outer space like f flying saucers or Apollo missions. Um, for me, it means inner space or the space to think. And I think it's music that is about the listener as much as it is about the notes. And it's music that has a tradition that goes back to ancient and sacred music as much as it does to modern experimental music and to and the post-psychedelic era perhaps as well. I think one thing to remember is that good art doesn't have to be entertainment but rather a place to journey in your mind. To use an example, a lot of the people that enjoy listening to my music are software engineers and they find that the music I make is a good stimulus to think to. Uh, they find it more modern, more interesting than, for example, classical music or jazz, but not as intrusive as pop music where the lyrics might distract your thinking process. So the music is very much about inner space and not exactly background music either because it's, it's a little edgy, it's a little weird, and it keeps your mind activated because there's a certain surrealist component to it, a certain oddity or novelty that makes the mind stretch a little bit. And so a lot of people who enjoy having music to think to find it to be very stimulating. But that doesn't mean it has to be background music either. A term I enjoy is Pauline Oliveros' term, deep listening, which is almost like a set of instructions to the listener saying that the more energy you put into the act of listening, active listening in fact, the more you get out of it. So a lot like minimalist art, the art itself might point away from itself and into the eyes of the viewer, and the more attention the viewer puts into the experience of being in this place where the art is, the more energy they get from it. Timbre is an important part of it, but it's not the only part. A lot of people think, for example, that this music is by necessity electronic music, but you could look at some of the, the harmonic singing of David Hikes, for example, and you could say that that's a similar territory of exploration in a purely acoustic uh, format. Um, I would even say that a composer like Arvo Pert or Terry Riley would be cohorts, perhaps not cohorts in age, but in intention of creating something that's more internal and more expressive of ecstasy or um, the beauty of some abstract part of existence, the realization of being alive. So tendency to think about timbre or instruments, I think, distracts from the idea that the music is psychoactive in its own way. And that it doesn't matter what the timbre is, although certainly elongated tones, use of delays and reverbs, use of electronics to bend and warp sounds into uh, unusual or surprising textures, that's definitely a part of it. And I think many of us who work in this vocabulary think about our compositions almost more texturally than in terms of notes. Um, I'm very attracted to classical Indian music, for example, and so most of my music is fairly simple harmonically. It's modal. There's something hiding in underneath whatever's happening, which is sort of rhythmic cycles and drone. And then for me, melody is the dominant focal point. That's not for everybody. Somebody like Steve Roach is dealing with these thick slabs of, of harmonic texture. Um, for all of us, I think, though, that there is uh, timbre and texture as part of the, the gestalt of the music. When we're trying to imagine the sound in our head, it's not just notes. Um, it's a full orchestration of textures. I would say probably my music has less uh, directly related to the Berlin School than many of my cohorts, although that footprint is so large that we all you know, strive to, to reference it in some way or to, to stay away from certain things that might have been too heavily explored. And with anything that is a precursor, even trying to avoid 
referencing is as much an influence as trying to make a reference. So I think that certainly the Berlin School is, is a major place on the time frame and on the, uh, on the flow of history of this kind of music. I think that there are waves of focal points and times in history when certain memes become interesting to, to a group of people. And I think, you know, I've used this phrase cohorts a couple times today, and I think that, you know, we got lumped as West Coast school for a while, or California school, which is funny because, you know, many of us weren't Californians. Uh, I was, Steve Roach was, but uh, Michael Stearns, you know, came from elsewhere and is, you know, a handful of folks, partially perhaps we became friends with Stephen Hill and he played us on Hearts of Space or something. Um, I felt perhaps if there was something that united us at the time, we all um, incorporated more organic, earthy elements into what we were doing. I know I certainly was conscious of that in my own music, bringing in acoustic instruments, bringing in a kind of um, world music flavor, um, and perhaps that was in reaction to the German sound, which was much more purely electronic or more from a rock or electric context. And I was very attracted to this kind of grounded feeling of the music coming up from out of the earth. And so, yes, perhaps that was um, a valid wave, you know, a, a perception that there were a bunch of people, us, doing things at the same time. On the other hand, I don't think that had much to do specifically with being on the West Coast. I think it had to do with the fact that we were a group of acquaintances that had shared interests at a certain time in the early 80s, trying to do something different. Um, absolutely, there's going to be cultural differences in ways that people think. And I think that's, that's wonderful, because I love diversity and I like having as much color and flavor as possible. To quote a line from a poem by David Allen, we are a community of hermits. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the irony, of course, is that many of us started doing this making a, a very private music, a very introverted kind of music, introspective and, and almost insular, hermetic, you know? And yet we want to communicate something um, beautiful to people. So we have to, you know, break through that, that interior space and open it up to the rest of the world. Um, there's a certain kind of person who's attracted to this approach to music. I don't think there's a whole lot of pop stars that have people coming up to them and say, when I first heard your music, it, re it sounded like the sound that was in my head in the most quiet moments. It was the sound I was born with in my head. You know, People have this feeling like it's their music. It's personal to them. And it just takes an odd cat to, to feel that. I mean, it's not for everyone. I never expected it to be mainstream. There was a strange time in the late 80s, early 90s when there was a little bit of a flutter about, you know, ambient or new age music, space music, trying to sell it. Uh, when major labels started these little sub-labels and they realized it doesn't sell enough. Um, but now with the evaporation of the independent record label scene, with the viability of distribution pretty much gone and most of us independent musicians can succeed doing exactly what we got started doing in the 80s which is publishing ourselves putting the albums out using the internet to promote to fans directly and personal outreach you know just uh, when I do this I go on tour small shows um, I talk to the listeners personally and there's a direct connection a heart-to-heart -heart sense of understanding. Everybody's feeling like this is their personal music. It's, it's, it's like some strange kind of folk music from outer space, you know? <laughs> it's, it's very personal. Um, they might never get it, and that's okay. <laughs> you know, like a lot of things, you see it, you hear it, it affects you, or it passes you by. Um, a lot of people don't understand 20th century abstract expressionist painting. Um, personally, when I look at a Rothko, I feel immenseness. I feel deep spirituality. I, feel, I, I, I see seeking. I see an artist trying to eradicate 
all earthliness from his paint until the paint becomes pure light. Now, try to say that to somebody who prefers portraiture or landscape, and they say, this looks like a bunch of paint on a canvas. I don't get it. You say, well, maybe that's okay. You don't have to get it. Um, not everybody's gonna understand Rothko. Not everybody's gonna understand what we're trying to do either, and maybe at a certain point, they'll come to a place where it makes sense to them. And they'll go, oh, wow, it involves this kind of listening. I hadn't tried listening to it this way before. Just as Rothko might involve a different kind of sitting in front of the painting, a different kind of looking. It's not going to be commercially viable to ask every listener to try a new way of listening. So we don't, we don't worry about that. We just try to make something honest and truthful. And those who are attracted to it will find something of value to it. And those that aren't, you can't, what is it, you, you, uh, you, <laughs> you, can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force it to drink, right? So somebody might be exposed to this. They might hear music like this in a film, and it might work in a context of a movie, but they'll never imagine that it could work on its own without some picture to go along with it. Um, personally, I've always preferred this kind of music to, to work with people's eyes closed, you know, make the movies in your head.